Hello there and welcome everyone to another edition of The Mars Bunker. It brings me great pleasure today to introduce you all to Diana Alcindi, a propulsion development engineer at Virgin Orbit and the founder of the Arabian Stargazer. How are you doing today, Diana? Fantastic. So exciting to see how many people we have here. Yeah, we've got uh, people in the audience from all over the world. We saw, um, where did we see? We saw Iraq, we saw Morocco, we saw France, we saw Germany, the Netherlands. Obviously, plenty of people in uh, North America as well and all over the world. Thank you so much for joining us all. So, um, Diana has been doing incredible work bringing the excitement of space exploration to a wider audience, creating bilingual content in English and in Arabic to inspire and encourage young people all over the world to consider careers in engineering. And we're so pleased that you could join us here today. And uh, we will be taking questions all throughout today's stream. So if you do have questions, just drop them in the comments and then I will highlight one of your questions and we'll see all the exciting things that uh, you have in store for us. So uh, just before we get started, a quick recap. So last week, we looked at the incredible work going on with the Starship project down in Boca Chica where the rocket that could one day take us to Mars is being designed and built. But today, we're going to be discussing a broad perspective surrounding future missions to Mars. So we've spoken before on this channel about the concept of a Martian society, but we haven't looked too much in detail about who the Martians, those first Martians, will actually be. This year is a fascinating year because there are actually three different countries sending missions to Mars in the launch window this year. We have the United States with the Perseverance rover, we have China with their Tianwen-1 mission, and the United Arab Emirates with their Mars Hope Orbiter, which we'll be talking about slightly later today. So as we consider in the future going from robotic missions to human missions, the key question is how do we widen involvement and make sure the whole world is involved? In missions to Mars. So uh, with my ramble out of the way, um, Diana, um, could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about your own background? Like how did you get into propulsion engineering and what is it like to work in the aerospace sector? Yeah, thank you for having me here, Ryan. This is really exciting. Um, I started as a college student who didn't know much English. Uh, I immigrated from, uh, from the Middle East when I was about 14 years old. And I, I joined a high school and a community college and went to university and studied chemical engineering. And I specifically picked chemical engineering because it was just a versatile major. You can, you can go in so many different careers and still, still be part of the space industry. So I studied chemical engineering. And when I was in college, I led a team that builds a, a 3D printed uh, monopropellant thruster that can be hooked into uh, a 6U cube, cubic satellite that goes to space. It was part of, uh, part of a CubeQuest uh, competition with NASA, and that slowly is was, well, was the full reason why I became a propulsion engineer as my first full-time job. And uh, it was really exciting because you can really merge chemical engineering with, um, with, the, with the physics and, and chemistry behind how to build an engine. So then uh, when I was in college, I started being part of internships with Northrop Grumman, uh, NASA JPL, Space Micro. These companies were, I wasn't doing uh, propulsion engineering specifically, but it led me to be part of, uh, be part of this field. And then I joined uh, Virgin Orbit as a, as a Brooke Owens Fellow. If you don't know what Brooke Owens Fellowship, um, I will happily share the link with you guys. It's a, uh, an, an organization, a fellowship actually, that provides you executive mentorship um, if you are a female who is passionate and excited about space. So then I was a propulsion um, engineer at Virgin Orbit and I work on uh, design and analysis and test of the Launcher One rocket. So one thing that you mentioned there that was really interesting was about um, 3D printing in particular, and also in the context of CubeSats, because when we think about um, the way that the space sector is evolving over time to create missions which have a lower cost and that are more flexible, one of the things that really excited me about NASA's InSight mission to Mars when it arrived in 2016 was that it had two CubeSats attached to it that yeah. were kind of like a tech demo just to see can CubeSats operate once you go beyond low Earth orbit. So um, 
I'm sure with um, with companies like uh, Virgin Orbit and their Launch One system, increasing access to space via having lower launch costs for smaller satellites. Um, I was curious, what what are your thoughts about the way that you can link in small satellites and CubeSats with this concept of broadening participation and meaning that more actors, whether they be countries, companies, etc., can access space? That's actually a really good question and thought because 3D printing is actually very accessible to so many countries, even the countries that are not necessarily have a space agency or have a huge flourishing uh, business in space because 3D printing is actually cheap. Anybody, including high school students right now, are building robots, cars, engines, parts that are 3D printed. You can 3D print in metal, you can 3D print in plastic. And looking at the history of, of space exploration, we haven't been to space that much. We've done a lot of accomplished uh, accomplishments in the past 60 years, but what are the things that we can do differently so we can go to space even more? And 3D printing brings in that really unique perspective because it is um, a lot of people have access to it, which means a lot of brains and eyes are looking at this technology, which can provide even broader perspective and understanding of, of the techniques of, of having a successfully 3D printed part. And having children to be part of uh, 3D printing, to understand 3D printing. A lot of schools have 3D printed or ma uh, makers labs, allowing them to understand what 3D printing is, going to bring in even more people into this field and more people are going to invent and develop uh, this industry. So it's it's a very cheap way of um, of bringing people together into this field. And I can't wait to see all the exciting missions that we can envision once the cost of not just accessing space from things like mm -hmm. reusable rocketry, but building the satellites and systems themselves will plummet. Because, I mean, across the world, there's almost unlimited potential in the imagination that scientists and engineers can come up with. And so I can't wait to see all these exciting applications yeah. of, I don't know, swarms of CubeSats around Jupiter or Saturn. Like, th there's incredible things to, uh, I, um... to think about there. I, I'm based in Los Angeles right now, and I recently discovered that there are uh, free 3D printers in, in local uh, public libraries. I oh. mean, if a library can provide 3D printing uh, capabilities, it's so just like going and, and renting a book. You can go and rent uh, your a spot at the 3D printer, and you can develop some parts. It's a great way. Um, it's a great gift for your children. If we have any parents right here and you have a, a child in your family, it's it's an awesome thing to to gift because it can it, you can understand engineering mechanisms and concepts through a toy. Uh, and hmm. what's better than that? And I think and this excitement for new ideas, I think Raj um, highlights this quite well. Um, when he says that he wants to build a CubeSat, equip it with many thrusters, solar sails, and just send it out to explore into deep space. Mm -hmm. there, there's so many, yeah, there, there'll be so many things that we can do once we can plummet all of these costs. So yeah. uh, you, you mentioned there about um, widening participation in space and getting more people involved, which is, of course, something that you've been doing a lot with the Arabian Stargazer, which um, uh, you created in 2018. So could you tell us a little bit about what the Arabian Stargazer is, um, how the idea came about, and uh, what your reception has been so far. Yeah, so when I graduated college in 2017, um, I started working at Virgin Orbit, and it was a really exciting job, but it just didn't didn't feel like it was enough. Um, I had this part of me, just this void that I wanted to fill on, on community outreach, and since engineering really changed my life, and uh, the, the passion towards space really developed my person personality when I was in college. I said, there must be something else that I have to do. Um, I, yeah, I work on engines uh, with Virgin Orbit. I do have a rocket, but I don't take it home. I don't put it on my shelf or in my garage. So I wanted to have something my own. So I started slowly figuring ways where I can bring the Middle Eastern countries to be, to be part of this field, show them why is it exciting, why is it beneficial, uh, and and just provide them with the experience that I didn't have when I was um, when I was a teenager in college. So I, I actually wanted to have uh, some kind of a fellowship slash scholarship where I can bring students from the Middle East to America, where we provide education 
and give them the skill sets of an engineer uh, so they can go back and invest in their countries. But that seemed like a crazy idea from from somebody who doesn't have much experience in, in nonprofit organizations and businesses. So I created the Arabian Stargazer. Um, it's on it's a public Instagram platform that basically communicates science in a fun and easy way uh, for people who don't necessarily have a lot of experience in, in space. And to my surprise, uh, in less than a year, it gained about 100,000 followers. And the messages and the comments and the engagement I received from people who live in the Middle East is incredible. A lot of people are excited and passionate and probably a lot smarter than me who just simply don't have the um, the the platform or or even the the resources or the opportunities. So I host videos. I used to do Badass Woman Tuesday where I, I highlight sp amazing women uh, that did amazing thing for the science uh, exploration and um, discoveries. I talk about why is it beneficial to go to space. I hold Q and A's, live streams with astronauts, and just bring in these people who have changed history to a platform that happens to communicate science in both languages. Because a lot of companies have the slogan of opening space for everyone, but how are we opening space for everyone? Are we doing it just in English and just for English speakers, or are we doing it for uh, a broader audience? So I have people from all, all around the world um, uh, discussing with me these amazing, uh, th these amazing inventions and, and uh, exploration that we are doing. So, so for everyone watching, I was just kind of showing some of uh, Diana's platform, the Arabian Star is there, which you can find out on Instagram, and I will link to that down in the video description um, after the live stream is over. Th there was one thing that you touched upon there, which I think is perhaps not appreciated as much, um, which is about the language barrier when it comes to space exploration, um, astronomy, astrophysics, aerospace, all of that. Um, because so much of the outreach material which is put out uh, by space agents in particular, by like mm -hmm. NASA and even like, the European Space Agency tends to be very English focused. So um, before before you came about, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what material was there for young people wanting to learn about space in in Arabic and how how hard have you found it to be to overcome this barrier? It's actually extremely difficult to find any material in Arabic. Um, on, on YouTube. If you go on YouTube and write, why do small satellites not fall from the sky in English, you get amazing videos, all types of animation, all types of cartoonish videos for children in all ages. If you write the same, line, the same sentence in Arabic, you won't find anything, absolutely nothing. There are amazing science communicators out there that speak Arabic, but if you have a few, that's not enough to, to have a broader audience. So there, this is the void that I want to, 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 uh, to fill. Uh, bring in high quality content as much as I can and talk in Arabic, even in, in, in Iraq, yeah, I'm from Iraq, so I, I don't speak formal Arabic and, and just bring in these people to the conversation and how can I um, explain simple physics phenomena uh, in Arabic because in, doing it in English only is not enough. A lot of people don't speak English, and um, and reading uh, reading these these uh, sciences online in English is is pretty complicated. Um, so I want to do that. It's not really easy to find anything in Arabic. And uh, before we move on, I just wanted to highlight. Uh, thank you very much for this comment, uh, Powell. Just pointing out that when we were talking about three D printing being cheap, the learning prototyping system, obviously. The materials and the feedstock for it can be expensive. And if you were to have a practical 3D printing system like printing components for a habitat on Mars, for example, then obviously it's going to be expensive to prototype it. So, uh, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, we just kind of meant compared to traditional yeah. methods of aerospace manufacturing. So it's all it's all about relative cost. But thank you very much for that point. And, and there is also subtractive machining. So when you're doing regular manufacturability in metals, you can go backwards. But with 3D printing, when you do subtractive machining, you can make your part and then it can, it, you can, if you don't like it, you can go back and it, it turns from metal to powder. That's a huge plus for us because 
a lot of times we make something, we test it, it doesn't work and we want to do it differently. Um, it's efficient, if, uh, a combustion chamber that takes, I don't know, six months to make, you can make it in a month if you're 3D printing it or using subtractive machining. So it is, it is expensive for an average person who has a day job and that's it. But mm. for, for these companies and private industries, it's a lot cheaper for them. Obviously there's investors who are, um, who are helping these companies flourish in 3D printing. It's not just for one person um, investing all their money into 3D printing. Sure. And and another audience question, this time from uh, Mustafa, about how helpful theoretical research is in the aerospace sector. And uh, I, I just wanted to quickly chip in on one aspect of this, which is that for when it comes to really large astrophysics missions, which you know needs the aerospace industry to even create the telescopes that we have, um, usually novel concepts require theoretical studies to start off before they, you get a grant for like a NASA advanced concept study that funds theorists to start and then it goes through stages to eventually assess is it even feasible to build it with one example being the concepts of the, the solar gravitational lens to directly image an exoplanet which would require you to get a one meter satellite out to about 600 astronomical units so it would be a huge engineering feat and so lots of theories have contributed to that so uh, i i don't know if you you want to add um something i think there, but you covered it theories well. theories important exactly <laughs> so um so what one thing that um and this is actually a question that uh, we got originally on the martian colonist discord uh, server from tj whale about um so the Arab world has a long and proud tradition of contributing to frontier scientific knowledge and pursuits. So when you look at words and phrases which are absolutely vital for all of science that we use today, like like algebra or algorithm or you know Arabic numerals that were like all of science rests on, um, much of that emerged in them in the Middle Ages in the 10th century in particular with. Uh, pioneers like uh, Al Khwarizmi, apologies, apologies if I'm mispronouncing uh, his name, um, who pioneered a lot of that stuff. So we were really curious to wonder about how are the past scientific achievements of great Arab astronomers perceived by young people today? Mm -hmm. I think it brings in a lot of hope. Uh, when you see an example in history of somebody who did amazing work in 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 science, you feel like there's hope that we've done something and culturally uh, things change based on the circumstances. I mean, if you look at if you look at just the history of science, the, the father of optics, Ibn al-Haytham, basically optics are cameras. We use cameras everywhere. I have it on my phone. We have it on satellites. It's a I couldn't do astronomy without optics. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a camera right here and we're using it. We wouldn't be able to take pictures of Earth, for example, and understanding our solar systems without cameras. If you look at uh, Abbas bin Farnas, uh, the first attempt into flying, would we be where we are today if somebody didn't really attempt flying? We have, we carry Launcher One Virgin Orbits rocket on a Boeing 747 airplane. That is thanks to those people who contribute to, to aviation and it really affected how, um, modern society views aviation. It is extremely important that we highlight these figures who did amazing work uh, for science. And I, I try to bring that up because I get a lot of arguments of people saying, well, it, the Arab board really, really uh, contributed to science. Yes, we wouldn't be where we are today without algebra, without optics, without uh, attempts of flying. So it's, I really hope we keep this in our curriculum. Whenever we teach history, we talk about these figures because it inspire the next generation. And and yet yeah, to touch on that, because there's a kind of classical narrative that we often hear if you look in most history books, which is like, okay, there was the classical civilizations, there was the Romans, and then there was the Dark Ages, nothing really happened, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden there was the Renaissance. And it's not like that at all, because while the Dark Ages were going on in Europe, scientific pursuits were flourishing in the Middle East. And that is the same time when we had many of these innovations coming about. And that was really the center of scholarly pursuit at that time. And so it's important that we highlight those great achievements of the past so that we can 
learn the lessons from it and chart a route to an exciting future that involves everyone in these scientific pursuits. Exactly. Outreach is extremely important too. And when you do outreach, talk about these uh, Arabic inventions and any inventions actually, and just show that we can develop even more and we can learn from those people on what mistakes they've done and what good things they've done so we can apply it to the future. So when you do outreach and you speak to, to children around the world, I'm curious as to what are they most excited about, about the future? And does it vary between, let's say, like Arabic speaking children in countries like Canada versus in the Middle East, for example? So, so yeah, what are kids excited about these days? <laughs> Majority of children want to go to space, uh, regardless where you're from. And to me, that's that's not even ironic because every single child mostly capable of looking up to the sky and seeing the stars and having a telescope and it's it's a common thing that we have it's like we want to go to space and we're very excited to go to space so um a few days ago i did a live stream and majority of the questions was how do i become an astronaut um, how do how do I get to NASA? Because there's this this idea that the only way you can be part of the space industry is work with NASA. And I always say that's not the case. There's a lot of countries and a lot of agencies and private sectors who are actually invested in space. So most children want to go to space and want to be astronauts. <laughs> because I I certainly had that because when I was when I was a kid growing up in the 90s in the UK, we didn't have a space program in mm -hmm. the UK. It was all it all had to be about making money before anyone would invest. So it was satellites and earth observation and communications. Yeah. But I wanted to be an astronaut and there wasn't, there wasn't a route to pursue that. So I can certainly em empathize with countries around the world where just because of where you happen to be born, you may not have the opportunity to pursue dreams like that. And it's really encouraging to see that that narrative is starting to shift now. Now, um, now, for example, we're getting new space agencies arising. We have one in the UK now. The United Arab Emirates launched a space agency just in the last few years, which is incredibly exciting. Um, more people are having the chance to pursue opportunities to go into space via private companies in the future as well, which will really open this up to the entire planet. So I was wondering how, how the perception of can I become an astronaut and can I work in aerospace has changed in the Middle East just in the last few years from developments like the UAA launching their space agency? Well, unfortunately, not a lot, because if you have a child in Palestine or Jordan or Syria and who wants to be an astronaut, there isn't really an easy path for them to be astronauts. Um, you, I honestly don't even know the requirements of being part of the uh, UAE space agency and how can you become an astronaut? Do you have to be... Uh, a citizen of the UAE, I am not sure. But it's not enough that we have only one space agency in the entire Middle Eastern region. If you look at the map and see how many people are invested in space and how many countries, um, it's not a lot. And UAE is actually the ninth country who's actually uh, trying to, to go to Mars. And that's not enough. We need a lot more. Um, we need a lot more people that could pave the way for our children to think that it is they're capable of becoming astronauts. So mm. science communicating is kind of, we're not, I'm not a space agency at all, but doing these, these live streams, answering questions, talking about science in Arabic, that could uh, bring in more people into this field and thinking it is possible, uh, answering very basic questions like, what should I study? Uh, what kind of things I can uh, I can buy for my child so I can, you know, grow that little seed so they they flourish mm -hmm. when they're older. That's important. Um, so outreach, having more figures in in space could inspire the next generation. And and of course you're you're doing a, a fantastic job by just you know existing with your platform. The Arabian Sun is showing I am a person who made it into aerospace. You could do what I am doing. Mm -hmm. Being a role model is, it's such an important thing. And if it even takes, so I often think about this when I Skype into schools, for example, in, in disadvantaged areas um, around the UK, that 
if 20 minutes of your time can make people think, hey, I could make it, I could become a scientist, that's it's a minuscule fraction of your time that can really make such a difference in people's lives. You, you don't realize it until it happens to you, honestly. Uh, I didn't meet my first figure at NASA until I was a junior in college. I've never met anybody from NASA. To me, NASA was the biggest dream ever. I want to work with NASA, I, I just do anything. Having that interaction with that engineer was a huge part of, of my, oh, I can do this too. Like I met somebody from NASA, I can definitely be part of this field. And all it took is an hour for that person to come to my university and talk to us about their research. So if you're capable of doing that, you don't have to be an awesome a speaker. You don't have to do amazing public speaking. If you have that passion, you have the time, just go do it. Talk to children. It can be in your family, your neighbors, um, schools, organizations, whatever it is. Because And the children these days, they, they will be the generation that will be going on to, to colonize Mars. And obviously... I mean, if you regularly watch this channel, you know what I think about how rapidly we'll be able to reach Mars. Mm -hmm. um, but those, besides the first people that are laying the foundation, the young people today will be the people that will be you know, emigrating to Mars and establishing the society there. So it's important exactly. that we make young people aware of these opportunities. Exactly. So let's shift to a few more uh, audience comments and questions. Um, so, um, and apologies if I mispronounced your name from uh, <laughs> Uh, Zinab, um, wondering about what the future of Arabs in science may be like, and what your thoughts are on that. This is really cool because I can I can recognize some of these names <laughs> from the Arabian Stargazer. Hi, Zainab. Um, I think, as I said, if we continue to bring in more countries to invest in space and understand why it's important to go to space, more countries are going to uh, build not necessarily just agencies, companies, uh, improve their curriculum in school, do outreach, and hopefully we go back to where we were. Um, based on the recent circumstances in the Middle East for the past 20 years, science wasn't the main focus, but I can see that it's changing right now. We're seeing that science is the only way for us to improve economically and like, in any different fashion that you can think of, but economically is a very good incentive for governments. And I think we're, we're heading there, seeing from the Arabian Stargazer and other platforms on how Arabs are very excited about space because space is just the way to go. Uh, you can learn so much about our planet through going to space and comparing the budget that we, we, we spend on space versus other things, it's not that much. So, um, it's it's a negligible amount that is spent is. on space, but it has such a profound effect mm -hmm. via all of those people that are brought into high tech industries and science through it. And uh, for example, like exemplified by this comment from Robert saying that, you know, all since the space age dawn, every child like grows up, they want to become an astronaut. They want to see space. And yeah. so it's a, it's a pity that only about 500 people have had that opportunity so far, but fingers crossed in the coming years with lower launch costs, private providers, et cetera, many more people than at any point in history will have these opportunities. So uh, a few more of your uh, your audience comments. So uh, Yesa just saying, uh, thank you very much, Diana. Iraq's proud That's of you. So sweet. Um, and uh, many, I see plenty of you commenting on the UK space agency as well. I don't want to get too much into that, but uh, <laughs> yes, I will say the UK was very bad because we had a rocket black arrow that we built. We launched it once and then we scrapped the program and I never forgave them for that. That was like in the sixties. So, mm -hmm. but hopefully the UK will get back on track. We have our own official astronaut now. So fingers mm -hmm. crossed that will improve over time. Um, yes, as Adam says, we have Tim Peake now. And uh, ah, uh, Ma points out that Saudi Arabia has a space agency now, and I wasn't actually aware of this. Uh, do, do you know much about their agency, Diana? I don't know much, but I know that Saudi Arabia is very big on science communication and, and bringing that access to more people. And, and trust me on this, you will see more from Saudi Arabia in 2021 in the coming years. It's very exciting. Okay, okay, I am uh, eager to hear more about this. So, um, okay, so where, where was I? I'm kind of all over the place. So, um, we've mentioned about 
um, these new space agencies and the missions they're doing. And I mentioned earlier about the Mars Hope mission, which mm -hmm. um, the United Arab Emirates are hoping to launch this year, all things, um, all things hopefully going according to plan. So, um, and for, for those of you who don't know, the essential scientific goal is to produce a global climate map of Mars, which will inform all future studies of the atmosphere of Mars. And so, and they'll be freely sharing all their data with the scientific community. So I'm really excited to see the results from this. But I was especially curious about the perception of the Mars Hope mission, because it's in there in the name to hopefully provide hope to people. So uh, is this just a mission that people in the UAE care about or does it have wider appeal? Um, yeah, how has it been perceived since they announced the mission? I think a lot of people are very excited for it. When I was in Dubai, uh, Dubai Air Show a few months ago and looking at the UAE Space Agency um, table and their entire booth, it was awesome. Lee, you see... Um, their, their astronaut was there. I was able to talk to him. He was he was very excited about uh, the future of UAE in space. And UAE is just aiming to do more than monitoring the uh, the atmosphere at, in Mars. They they want to build it and not buy it. And by building it, that doesn't mean having everything from scratch, but instead working with other people who are trying to go to Mars, like NASA, and and try to learn from that and, and have these collaborations. And from the name, we see that the UAE is investing into space, not simply just to, to do scientific missions on Mars, but also to bring in more, um, more people to be, to be excited about space. Their leadership thinks that it is exciting and important to go to space. Uh, all developing countries are going to space. So there must be something that we need to do, to do there. Uh, so their their goal is to send the probe to Mars before UAE's 50th anniversary in December 2021. To to think the UAE existed for only 50 years and they're going to Mars, that's exciting and that's hopeful. Yeah, it it really is, and I I mean obviously I'm excited about the scientific results about it. But given that I mean I saw in the UK how inspiring it was when we had our first official astronaut go up a couple of years ago and children around the country were so excited and exhilarated by that. So, and of course, UAE, the UAE had um, their first astronaut go to the International Space Station for mm -hmm. um, for a short period. I think it was around a week or nine days or so in uh, last yeah. year. So what do you think is more inspiring for young people, kind of the engineering aspect of building a probe, going to going to another world, or having an astronaut, someone like them, going into space. Having somebody go to space, there? for sure. <laughs> having somebody to go to space and speak Arabic on the International Space Station, that's huge. Just language brings in a very poetic uh, perspective to this. And, and, and seeing somebody who is dark colored, who speaks Arabic, who comes from... Arab or Arabic origins that is exciting and what's only what's exciting even more is having that astronaut be um, um, accessible to people I heard actually that he goes to every single school in the UAE and talks to students there imagine talking to an astronaut the first astronaut from your country that goes to space and whatever he, I don't know specifically what he did in the International Space Station, but he was in space. And having having that uh, role model is so important. And I hope uh, they do even more outreach to showcase that. Yeah, it, it adds it adds the human touch to it because you can yeah. visualize yourself being there and being a part of it when you see that. Mm -hmm. And often when people ask me about why why we're thinking about sending humans to Mars instead of just continued robotic exploration, it mm -hmm. often boils down to that inspirational factor that um, when we look at what what I sometimes term the Apollo effect, that in the decade that followed the moon landings in the 60s and 70s, the number of young people studying science in the United States doubled. The number of people doing PhDs in physics tripled. Like There's almost no other thing you can imagine spending money on that has that ripple effect all throughout a country and across the world. 
And we need to replicate this in as many countries around the world as possible to really deal with the problems that we're going to face on the planet in the 21st century. So you're not just launching money on a rocket into space and then it's gone. You have profound effects right down yeah. here on the Earth. Yeah, when we went to, to the moon, uh, like when you watch uh, Hidden Figures and you watch, watch all these movies, you see the entire country is simply focused on that mission. And when we landed on the moon, everybody was watching it on TV. Everybody was listening on the radio. It just like, it gave me goosebumps when I remember I remember the, the speech the president gave. It's so exciting. And when we see more more leadership to be to be um, you know pushing to go to space, that's hopeful because it creates uh, a huge impact. Hmm. And as quantified just by uh, Robert here, that um, there's a four to one downstream ratio from Apollo, just from the benefits back to an economy as well. Wow. So you're not spending money on space; you make money from space. So I don't quite buy these arguments about why we shouldn't spend money on space. Yeah. Um, I mean, the inspiration alone would justify it in my mind. But uh, exactly. any, anyhow, we're going a little bit uh, off topic there. So, um, OK, so a couple more uh, audience comments and questions. Um, if you have a comment or a question, now's the perfect time to uh, send them in, everyone. So um, let's see. Um, Raj just points out that the UK Space Agency and ESA are working together. Good, good um, to hear. Yeah, that's that's always good to hear. And, and also, we're seeing this a lot with... Um, China cooperating with the European Space Agency as well. And I'm sure some of you saw that China recently tested um, a new uh, crew capsule just a couple of days ago. So uh, they're, they're really doing impressive things in space and expanding all of that. And um, and I hope that um, the agencies like the UAE will also like widely cast their net and collaborate with other space agencies to kind of spread out mm -hmm. the skills, the existing knowledge, and space should be for collaborative endeavors at the end of the day. Exactly. And uh, there, there were um, some of you that had points earlier. So um, I, I take this point, Eric, thanks for raising it about the terminology of the Dark Ages. Um, of course, it was the medieval period. I was just trying to refer to this classical narrative that people have been spreading for centuries and how it doesn't actually hold light when you consider what was going on all around the whole world. But uh, point taken. Thank you for making that. And uh, yeah, uh, lots, um, lots more people saying, uh, again, thanks for being such a good role model, Diana. Everyone clearly appreciates the work that um, you are doing. That's so sweet. Yeah, so thanks for that, uh, everyone. So um, if we think about further in the future, one thing that I found most fascinating about um, the UAE Space Agency's approach is that they launched an initiative called uh, Mars 2117, three years ago. The idea being that they wanted their entire space efforts to be tied around the idea of we should be doing incremental steps that 100 years from now will lead to a self-sustaining city on Mars. And I love that forward-thinking vision um, and just saying this is the goal, we're going to do everything to achieve it. So we'll perhaps get a little bit more speculative um, here. So... Um, so what are your thoughts, Diana, about this vision of establishing a city on Mars? Um, and then, yeah, then we'll just take it from there and kind of uh, go off on yeah. interesting tangents. So as I said, the UAE is among the top nine countries in the world that invest in space sciences. And that is not simply by having just a space agency, but also uh, sending their first astronaut, having astronomy part of a uh, part of their educational programs, having space camps, having the UAE aim to establish the first human settlement in Mars uh, by uh, 2117 uh, is exciting because it aligns with a lot of uh, other countries' vision to go to Mars as well. I mean, Elon Musk is is building uh, the spacecraft Starship, and you said that your last episode was about that. Uh, it is basically having multiple of their super heavy rockets uh, coll collectively referred to as Starship. If we have this billionaire wanting to go to space and he's doing it pretty well and pretty efficiently, um, I don't see why we can't do that everywhere else too. So having a human settlement is obviously difficult. We probably have to go to the moon before and, and, as we know, if we go to the moon, because we've been there before, we go there again, 
and uh, create some kind of a settlement so we can charge our rocket. We can, um, it's basically like a base before we can go to Mars as well. So it 2117 is a long time from now, but I think the country is, is adding this big picture. So, so in advance in uh, early ensures that the next leadership hopefully follows the same mission. Uh, young people start working on that um, early, basically. And I mean, I'm certainly hopeful that with with all these new developments in reusable rocketry and the Starship program, for example, although Starship is being built in the US, it won't just be a US only launch system. Mm -hmm. When we see things like, um, I mean, the Dragon capsule, for example, or Dragon 2, for example, there are many organizations that have looked at whether they could book a mission on that to go to exactly. either their own space station or um, inflatable space hotels, space tourism will open up from that. By developing these vehicles, I would be, to be honest, I would be surprised if it took as long as 2117. Because if the UAE didn't have to develop the new rocket technology, if they could just purchase 50 seats on a system like Starship, which will probably be commercially available for such endeavors by the late 2030s, it may happen much sooner than we actually expect. That's what I would hope. Mm -hmm. But what we are seeing that's really encouraging is that when the UAE Space Agency have talked about this, it wasn't just, we're going to go to Mars in 100 years, and that was it. Mm -hmm. They're actually doing some things that other space agencies are barely considering. We, we've spoken on my channel before about the missing technologies for going to Mars. People like Elon Musk are building the transport system, but if you get there and you have nowhere to live, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the UAE Space Agency at the moment are going through the design process for something they call Mars Science City, which yeah. will be like, I, I, my understanding, but well, this will probably change because I say they're still designing it, is that these will explore the ideas of uh, dome-like architectures for cities on Mars being built in Dubai. And we need to have much more creative endeavors going on exploring how we're going to live on Mars, not just how we're going to get there. So I, I can certainly see how the endeavors of their space agency can link in very well with what other private companies and governments are doing. So it's not competition here. Everyone is studying a different part of the puzzle piece that will all fit together to eventually yep. send us to Mars. And it's definitely not something you can do alone. Uh, you need to learn from history. You need to apply new methods of doing things more efficiently, cheaper, um, and having more people be involved is is awesome. And wow, thank you very much, Mike, for the uh, the super chat there. What's um, that? So uh, in yes, red. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a special. So that's Mike chipping in to uh, support the channel. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, anyone who does put in super chats, um, the money will be going towards things like equipment upgrades for my channel. And um, so I have slightly more time to focus on the content. So I do greatly appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mike. So, uh, OK, um, we have about 10 minutes left. And I want to devote as much of this as possible to your audience questions. So keep sending them in, everyone, because uh, there's no shortage of interesting topics that uh, we can point out. And uh, oh, yes, uh, I should point out, yeah. Um, I will be giving a talk about uh, exoplanet atmospheres that um, Maybe after this live stream, um, if you can comment down below with a link to your program in case other people want to see that live stream, that'll be in about two weeks or so. So if anyone's interested in my exoplanet research. So uh, a question from Mustafa about um, rocketry. So what's involved in the actual construction process from the various components that you work on? You mentioned 3D printing, but yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about the construction process? So to his question, do you use welding for the rocket parts or bolts? We use both. We definitely have some places where we can afford using bolts and fittings, but a lot of times we use welding as well. Um, it is a, um, a process that have been used on many different uh, parts, not specifically just a rocket, but how you build cars and uh, TVs and stuff like that. Things in the house, uh, we use welding uh, and, and fittings as well. And okay, this is a this is a fun broad question from Mawa about what the point of moving to Mars is. 
And I'll be really curious to hear if, especially when you speak to young people, the perspective of why we should go to Mars differs in the Middle East. So, yeah, because I'm very curious about that. So why? Why Mars? I mean, when you get to Mars, you probably have jumped so many different hoops and learned so many things uh, in science and in technology that could probably benefit and impact other aspects of our lives. The reason why we go to Mars, because we need to explore other planets. And by exploring other planets, you uh, capitalize on the resources that we have on Earth and you learn more about uh, our home planet. And why not explore the universe? There's so much things out there that we have not discovered. We haven't even discovered the ocean. So having putting some type of budget and um, all these talents, young talent, into going to outer space and for space exploration can actually directly impact us on Earth. And actually, I have a series of short videos that I post on the Arabian Stargazer on why is space exploration helping us here on Earth? And a lot of people have confused that um, uh, throughout the years on, okay, let's not waste money. Let's, uh, let's solve the problems of hunger we have here and uh, many different problems that we have on Earth, but not realizing that actually you can solve these problems through going to Mars, through going to other planets as well. Exactly, because the technological challenges of being able to live on Mars, and which links into another question from Mustafa about the biggest obstacles of living on Mars, people on Mars, just to survive, they will have to be more efficient at recycling almost everything than any place on Earth currently is. You, we don't have to think on Earth about recycling our air, for example. And on the spacecraft to Mars, you know, every single atom that you bring with you, you can't replace until you get to Mars. Exactly. So the, the solving these challenges will make life on Earth better. It'll make it more environmentally sustainable. And there will be so many innovations that will improve life here on the Earth. Like solar panels, originally, they were largely developed for space applications. Mm -hmm. And look at how... Um, Solar panels are now a vital part of energy supplies for many countries. So, yeah, Mars doesn't exist, although it's a long way away, more than, what, like 200 kilometers, 200 million kilometers, I should say, away. It doesn't exist entirely in isolation. Physics is the same, regardless whether you're on Earth and Mars. Chemistry is the same. Solve problems on Mars, you also solve them on Earth. Mm -hmm. And I really want to touch upon this question, since it's specifically about... Um, uh, mentions astronomy. So uh, from Lebanon. So what I would say from my own experience, so I did not train straight away in astronomy, even though that's what I did today. Me too. And there are many routes. Yeah. And same for engineering. You like The paths that you go through into either like aerospace or into academia, in my case, they're never linear. They always tend to meander about. They branch off in different directions. In my case, I studied I studied physics in school because that was the science that had the most space in it. And that was my metric. If it has space in it, I'll study it. And then I did a degree in physics. And then from that, I gradually shifted into space. So the key thing for you that I would advise if you really want to get into astronomy is look into the requirements for astronomy PhD programs around the world. And it doesn't matter where you live, where you're born from, anyone can apply to be in these PhD programs. Mm -hmm. And universities will just sponsor you for a visa for those programs. So there's not usually citizenship restrictions. So yeah, yeah so research astronomy PhDs and look at how you chart, see where you want to be, where you are now, and try and gradually chart the path to connect those dots. And you'll get there, yeah. you'll yeah. get there. Yeah, you don't necessarily need an astronomy degree to be part of space. That's the cool thing about mm -hmm. it. You can study art, and you can be part of this field. You can study medicine and be part of space. I mean, there's so many physicians that went to space. So just have a technical degree and be passionate about that and start be apply to projects that can help you learn more skill sets that are relevant to space. That's what I did. Yeah, and it was, it was the same for me as well. Like there's, just keep chasing the opportunities, keep pursuing it, keep passionate and you will get there. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, Bjorn, as well, for this super chat. Always really appreciated for anyone that supports this channel. 
Um, and plenty more content is being planned, and this all helps to continue to produce all of this. Okay, I spy another space nut trying to paraphrase uh, Kennedy's speech. I will not attempt to butcher Kennedy's accent as much as I would like to do it. <laughs> um, but there are many challenges. There are mountains to climb, channels to swim. But we choose to go to Mars. Yes, we do. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Um, wow, the, uh, the comments and questions are really coming in. Um, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> dear, just uh, trying to keep up with them all now. Um, so, yeah, a question from Bjorn here about how can ordinary people help with space if you don't um, either don't have the opportunity or if you don't go down that long and laborious route to either get a PhD or get a master's degree or or go into engineering or aerospace? How can ordinary people help? This is a good question. Um, you want to help space exploration without having a specific technical degree. Teach your children. Teach your children why is it important to be to go to space. Um, teach your children to think systematically and strate strategically. Uh, a lot of times we give random toys to children and we don't really talk to them about the importance of science. So uh, amplifying why science is important to young people can help develop that passion uh, early on. I mean, when I was young, I didn't even have Lego. Nobody gave me Lego. And nobody gave me tools to play with. I used to watch my grandfather weld metal plates in our backyard. And I was in Baghdad. I was probably either five or 10 years old. I don't even remember. And uh, that memory resonates so much in my mind. So having that type of memories and experiences for children, I'm sure uh, this generation has more access to many more things than me. But showing that uh, resources and opportunities could uh, could be a direct impact to helping space. Hmm. One thing I did want to point out here as well from the astronomy perspective, in that we quite often create citizen science projects where anyone around the world without technical qualifications can help us to make scientific discoveries. So if you want to help detect exoplanets, for example, on the Zooniverse platform, we have the Planet Hunters site. You can analyze observations that are being taken right now by the, the test satellite and look for planets. You can classify galaxies. There are, there are so many areas that you can work on and contribute to space. And we really need help because although algorithms like machine learning systems are getting better, in many astronomy situations, the human eye is still the premier facility. and Graduate students and researchers don't have enough time to classify millions of images, so you can really help. And the people that contribute to these platforms sometimes even make discoveries that we would have missed otherwise, mm -hmm. because our algorithms, we program them to search for things that we think should be there. So the true exactly. surprises, like um, a couple of years ago, that alien megastructure star, which turned out not to be aliens, it was just a weird dipping uh, system due to dust rings and various other components that wouldn't have been seen if it wasn't for citizen scientists. So you can really help regardless of where you are in the world. So yeah, check out the Zooniverse platform. That's one of the ways you can really contribute to astronomy. Okay, and uh, oh, okay, this is another great question from Raj. Where should we explore or go to after Mars? Because there's a lot in the solar system to see. So a long time from now, <laughs> The, the entire world is focused on the moon and Mars. Yeah, I mean, I, I during my undergraduate, I did some work on analyzing observations from the Venus Express mission um, during its final year or so orbiting Venus. And there are so many fascinating mysteries. We have no clue about what's going on in Venus. We don't know whether it used to, obviously we know that ancient Mars had large deposits of water. We don't know if that's true of Venus because it had a runaway greenhouse effect and lost much of its water to space. There are so many things we could learn if we had like floating scientific observatories in the Venusian atmosphere about 50 kilometers above the surface. So I would like to see missions to Venus. There's lots of people Titan. that want to mine the asteroid belt. Titan, oh yeah, well, Dragonfly yeah. is obviously going to Titan and we're going to learn so much about that in mm -hmm. the coming years. And, and obviously I, I hope that people, that many of the young people that we inspire with all the work that uh, the two of us and many other science communicators are doing, 
will inspire that generation of young engineers that will tackle the problems like how do we build interstellar probes? How do, you know, centuries from now we consider interstellar missions? That's a long way off, but it's not as far off as you might think. And touching upon the question we got way at the beginning, theoretical work in aerospace looking at interstellar probes is a very hot topic right now. So theory and practice come together very nicely in yeah. space and in aerospace. Yeah. Okay, so we have about five more minutes, everyone. So last chance for questions. Oops, uh, got the wrong question, but um, okay. Although uh, Robert, yeah, and Enceladus and Europa, amazingly important for scientific research. Let's go try and find some, I don't know, alien plesiosaurs swimming down in the seas there. I would love to see what's living down there. Uh, question from Mac about uh, point to point. Hi, Mac. <laughs> point to point space transport and whether, I mean, for a long time, it'll be a limited number of people that will get to go to Mars. So perhaps the technologies that are being developed to take us to Mars could revolutionize transport on Earth far sooner and hence improve people's lives. That's exactly right. Okay, okay. Um, more of your questions coming in. Um, so a question from Brian here about solar system wide communications systems. So I'm curious, um, Diana, about um, the way that CubeSats could potentially contribute to this. Um, Cause you'll probably know, well, you will know far more about them than I do. Like where do we currently stand with communi miniaturized communication technology? on CubeSats, and could we use that to build something akin to the deep space uh, network, but for a mm -hmm. fraction of the cost? Yeah, I mean, we're using CubeSats right now to, uh, like SpaceX, for example, is building Starlink, and that's to provide internet for, for wider, uh, wider countries, uh, many, many more countries. And that's important. I mean, CubeSats are doing that, satellites are doing that, and you can use CubeSats to, um, to develop more missions in a more cost-effective way. I mean, when I was in university, I built a 6U uh, CubeSat with a 3D printed rocket uh, rocket engine, small engine, and that taught me something about engineering. It didn't necessarily go to space, but it was it provided an edu educational purpose. So we can do that um, by using by using CubeSats. So many different schools and countries are doing that right now. Hmm. And okay, uh, where did that go? Um, a follow on question from the previous one about how to get into astronomy. Can you study biology and get into astronomy? Um, yes. The answer is yes, absolutely. And and this holds more general. Like Diana, you mentioned right at the beginning about how in propulsion engineering, it's not just one field that exists in a vacuum on its own. There's chemistry and there's physics and all of this fits together. But to answer this specific question, I know people that are actively working in astrobiology at the moment, involved in the search for life on exoplanets. And people that come in from a background in biology can go through and look at origin of life theory and experiments. And that informs us as astronomers as to what to even look for when we're looking for alien life. So just pursue what it is that you're passionate about. Keep an eye out for how it links into space and you can find mm -hmm. a way there. Don't don't ever be in the situation where you feel that you have to pursue a different, a certain subject and you choose something that you don't enjoy doing just because you think that will take you there. Yeah. There are unlimited routes to get into the space sector. I mean, on Mars uh, Bunker, you have an episode with Morgan and she's also a Brooklyn yeah. fellow. And she talks about agriculture and how she's developing that and to learn more about agriculture in space. This is very, very directly related to biology. So you can study biology and still be part of biology, uh, be part of space field. There's an, uh, an interview I did with uh, Dr. Scott, who, who is a physician, who probably studied biology, something related to biology, and is also an astronaut. I have that on uh, the Arabian Stargazer YouTube channel. He answers a bunch of questions about that. So if you're interested to, to be part of the uh, space industry, and still study biology. Uh, NASA's doing that too. So there's a lot of opportunities there. 
So I think we'll probably just take uh, two more questions. Um, so uh, here is one about uh, the different routes and in particular about becoming an astronaut. So um, if a BSc in petroleum engineering, how could this help to become an astronaut? Yeah, petroleum engineering is very uh, related to chemical engineering and chemical engineering is vastly used. It's it's basically the same physics and science and chemistry that we use in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering. So if you if you can develop the next best fuel to go to space efficiently, that would be very, very awesome. Um, and your degree will be extremely uh, relatable. And I think the last question that we'll just uh, touch upon is uh, about training opportunities for foreign PhD students. So there are kind of two aspects in this that I would like to touch upon. One is that if you're just looking for PhD programs, uh, you can apply to them regardless of where in the world you are. As I mentioned earlier, they're not tied usually to nationality. But if you're already doing a PhD at um, an institute, which I think is your question, and you're looking for training opportunities in other countries, the thing to look for is summer schools and programs. And um, so, so for example, um, oh, I'll, I'll have to see if I can find, because there's a Twitter thread somewhere that summarizes like every single summer school in astrophysics in the US. And there's like, 30 or so different ones and you can apply to them from anywhere in the world and then they'll just sponsor you a visa and just get that sorted all for you so in short there are plenty of opportunities and diana could you tell us a little about what well, opportunities to bring people with expertise from all around the world to work in the aerospace sector and is that complicated at all in the us compared to like because i'm just thinking from my own academic experience and i know it's harder in aerospace it's very hard in aerospace, unfortunately. I mean, uh, there's all these ITAR rules and regulations. It's not really easy to to divide um, the space sector from um, military and defense. It's kind of uh, categorized that way. So the, the way that we can do this is get the degrees and work on work on projects that are related to space, but they're not necessarily part of a you know, a company that can hire you specifically for that position. And hopefully more people can build space camps and build uh, space agencies and private companies in the Middle East so we can have that there without these ITAR rules and, and regulations. So hopefully in the future, I build a space camp all around the, uh, the Middle East where I can teach engineering skill sets, 3D printing, CADing, um, public speaking, all of these things that really shaped my career. And and we, we see the Middle East flourishing uh, in that industry and more people can be involved. And I would also add that although you, you mentioned ITAR can be an issue in the US, there are many opportunities in Europe as well. And Europe um, has less of those restrictions. So um, cast your net wide when looking for such opportunities and you, you'll, you'll find them. Um, mm -hmm. If anything, the big issue is that they're not publicized as widely as they should, but they are yeah. there. Yeah, they are there. So um, do you have any final closing thoughts, Diana, that you'd really like to communicate to our audience today? I am very hopeful for the future. I am very excited uh, for for what's, what's about to happen. Every time I join these live feeds and I see how many people are supportive and encouraged, uh, it's it warms my heart. And I hope that you learn something new every day um, if you're not necessarily excited about science or space, yet you're still here, then you are excited and, and passionate about space. So keep going, keep exploring, keep looking up. Um, it's going to be awesome. The future is going to be awesome, and I cannot wait to see what we find. So uh, with that, uh, we will, uh, well, we'll wrap up now. But one thing I will say, so, um, so I am working at the moment on the next um, Mars mission update on my channel, these almost like documentary length videos. Um, which, and there hasn't been one of those, I apologize, since December. Um, so what that means is there won't be a Mars bunker next week because I need to take the time to work on the script and the editing and preparation for that. So we'll be taking a brief intermission from the Mars bunker series while I get that Mars mission update done. 
So don't worry when you don't see me next weekend. I'm still alive. And um, so consider it almost like a mid-season break. And after the Mars mission update is out, probably in about two weeks time, then we will resume. So if you have any guest suggestions in the meantime, please do comment them down below. And please join me, everyone, in thanking Diana for taking the time to speak to us all today. Um, and, uh, well, I guess I will see you in the next uh, Mars mission update. And after that, in the Mars bunker. So bye, now. bye for now, everyone. We'll see you next time.